How you doing guys? Welcome to another video. This is still topic 6.1, chemical kinetics. And in this one, we look at how can we speed up the rate of reaction. Let's go. Okay, topic 6.1, how can we speed up the rate of reaction? We look at the factors affecting rate and then we discuss the energy profile diagrams as well. Your IB applications and skills is we need to talk about decreasing the activation energy and how a catalyst affects that. We talk about how those things affect the, how the temperature, pressure, concentration and particle size affect the rate of reaction and then we throw in some Maxwell Boltzmann as well. So the four main factors that affect the reaction rate are surface area, concentration, temperature and catalysts. For a surface area, just imagine you've got some sherbet, you put that on your tongue, the sherbet's a fine powder, as soon as that dissolves on your tongue there's a reaction which creates the fizz which is the carbon dioxide. Now if we have lumps or big clumps of the sherbet, that actually has quite a small surface area. When we compare that to something like a powder, a powder has a much larger surface area. So the surface area is all the surface of the particles added together. So in a powder, we have a lot, a lot more particles at the surface of that solid. So that means there can be more interactions between the surface and the reactants, especially if we're using a solution. The solution can get in there, there can be more collisions between the particles at the surface and the solution. So that means that there will be a greater chance of a successful collision. So having a greater surface area just increases the number of collisions. Probability says the more collisions we have, the greater number of successful collisions. It doesn't change the amount of energy required. It doesn't lower the energy. All it does is provide more collisions, which will hopefully lead to a faster reaction rate. If we, <coughs> excuse me. If we have a look at the diagrams on the left hand side, we can see that if we have a cube, then only the particles on the outside can react with the solution. The solution would have to eat away all those particles on the outside to get to the ones inside. If we take that solid and crush it up though, we can have a much higher surface area. So we've broken all those particles apart. Now the solution can get in between, it doesn't have to pull apart the solution to find somewhere to react. So the key things are, is we have an increased number of collisions, which increases the chance of a successful collision. So talking about concentration. So reactions involving ions in solution occur faster if the concentration of the dissolved particles is increased, the molarity is increased. If we have more particles, that's gonna to lead to a larger number of collisions, which will then lead to a greater chance of a successful collision or more of a chance of having successful collisions. We can do the same thing with gases. So if we have a gas, we can increase the concentration of the gas by changing the pressure. So if we shrink the volume of a container, that's like increasing the concentration because there's less space between the particles, which means there will be more collisions between the particles. The greater number of collisions, the greater the number of successful collisions. So we can employ a gas cylinder to help with that by reducing the, the volume. Now on the left hand side here I have a little bit of an animation where we have a 0.55 molar solution and if we place that in we can see our reactants there's a lot of space between them there's lots of solution there's not many collisions occurring between the reactant molecules simply because there's just not as many of them. If we start to increase the concentration, so taking it to one molar, which is doubling the concentration, this means we should double the rate. So now we have a lot larger number of particles in the solution. That's going to lead to the chance of a collision occurring more frequently and then a greater chance of a successful collision. If we go to the two molar solution, well, that should be four times faster than the 0.5 molar solution. And here we have just a larger number of particles. There's virtually no space between them and we see a very large reaction rate. We might be asked to graph a little situation like that. So this first graph would be the 0.05 molar solution. You can see at the start, the reaction rate's quite fast, but then it will start to slow very quickly to reach a point where all of the reactants have been used up. The one molar solution, well, it will reach the same amount of products, but just faster. 
and then the two molar solution would be faster again. But they're still reaching the same point because there was the same amount of limiting reagent. The only thing the concentration can do is make it occur faster, which is what we're trying to show with those graphs. Okay, another factor to increase the reaction rate is an increase in temperature. We've looked at temperature in a Maxwell-Boltzmann curve, but we'll just go over it again. If we increase the temperature, we're increasing the average kinetic energy of the particles. If we have particles that have a greater kinetic energy on average, that means we're gonna have more particles that are able to overcome the activation energy. The more we increase the temperature, the greater the increase in kinetic energy. Remember that reactions can only take place when they collide with enough energy to overcome the activation energy and also in the right orientation. So by increasing the kinetic energy, we're helping overcome the breaking of the bonds in the reactants and that's gonna to lead to more successful collisions. Remember that at any instant, under any conditions, a lot of particles sit in the average section of the Maxwell-Boltzmann curve and a few of them will have enough energy to react. What we're trying to do is get a bigger triangle underneath the curve or a bigger area underneath the curve which is above the activation energy. So even increasing the temperature by 10 degrees we can see a significant difference in the amount of particles that have energy over the activation energy. If we increase it by 20 degrees, we see that even more. Eventually we get to a point where increasing the temperature doesn't have that much of an effect because we're basically having all of the collisions being successful. But for sort of room temperature and temperatures up to 100 degrees, we can see a great impact. Okay, so catalyst. The catalyst is the last factor that increases the rate of reaction. And many industrial processes wouldn't be efficient if we didn't have a catalyst. There's two types of catalysts. There's a homogeneous catalyst, where the catalyst is in the same state as the reactants and products, and a heterogeneous catalyst, where the catalyst is in a different state to the reactants and products. So if you remember back to topic 10, where we started, studied esters, we had an alcohol and an acid, and we added those together with a certain catalyst. What was that catalyst? It was concentrated sulfuric acid, H2SO4 liquid. Now our alcohol was a liquid, our acid was a liquid, or usually a liquid, and we add in our sulfuric acid, so that's a homogeneous catalyst. A homogeneous catalyst. If we have something like the Haber-Bosch process, which is the production of ammonia, we would have a vessel that has a, a whole bunch of mesh in that vessel. Now the mesh is an iron mesh, so that would be a heterogeneous catalyst because it's in a different state to the reactants and the products. So how does a catalyst work? Well, what happens is the particles in the reaction meet on the surface of the catalyst. They absorb to the surface. When they absorb to the surface of the catalyst, they basically lower their activation energy. There is an attraction between the surface and the reactants. The reactants are then in a better orientation to meet and form the products. So the reactants will meet on the surface of the catalyst the catalyst helps orientate them, that lowers their activation energy, and then they're able to form products. So essentially the products, they form a partial bond with the surface of the catalyst, and then when they meet, they form the new bonds in the products. So we still have the same process occurring. We have the bond breaking in the reactants, forming a partial bond with the catalyst, then they react together to form the products, and then the products move off and the process can be repeated. Catalysts are often a, are a powder or a sponge. That's because we want to have a large surface area for the reactants to come into contact with. Sometimes though, when we have a catalyst, the catalyst can become poisoned. So after a fair period of time, we do have to replace the catalyst. It's not involved in the reaction, but if we're using excess amounts of reactants, some of those reactants can poison our catalyst. Catalysts, very big area of research. We want to make sure we have a catalyst wherever possible. It reduces the required conditions and especially temperature. Temperature costs a lot of money and it's something we want to try and reduce. Okay, so we've touched on this before but we're gonna go back over it again. When we have a catalyst and we have our energy 
profile diagram, we can show how the catalyst affects that energy profile diagram. So this is the Harbour process again, the manufacture of ammonia, which is a common one the IB like to use. Without a catalyst, it takes a large amount of energy to break the bonds in the reactants, so we have a really high activation energy. 3000 degrees is what's needed, so it's a very large activation energy. Therefore, we need to employ a catalyst to try and reduce that activation energy and make this process as efficient as possible. So with the introduction of a catalyst, it lowers our activation energy and lowers our required temperature down to about 500 degrees. The catalyst does not change the delta H, the delta H remains the same. So in this case, minus 91 kilojoules per mole. All the catalyst can do is lower the activation energy. So with no catalyst, we have a small proportion of particles that have energy above the activation energy. But on the addition of the catalyst, we have a large, or a significantly larger proportion of particles with enough energy to overcome the activation energy. We've also been able to lower the temperature, which will reduce the cost significantly. So a larger proportion of particles above the activation energy means that there's going to be more successful collisions. The more successful collisions, the greater the reaction rate. Now a catalyst will also reduce the activation energy of both the forward and reverse reactions. Now we touch on forward and reverse reactions in the equilibrium topic, but whenever you see the double-headed arrows, it's an equilibrium system. So look out for those double-headed arrows. So for example, the industrial production of hydrogen gas is an equilibrium system, where we have methane and water reacting to form carbon dioxide and hydrogen. I know it's an equilibrium system because in the reaction we have our double-headed arrows. This is also an endothermic reaction, so we would have to give it energy for this process to go ahead. A question might say sketch an energy profile diagram for the reverse reaction, so be really careful with the words here. So the forward reaction would be reading it from left to right, the reverse reaction would be reading it from right to left. So we've got to flip this thing around. So I'm going to rewrite it in the reverse direction. So we would have carbon monoxide plus hydrogen gas forming water and methane. And now we need to draw our energy profile diagram for that reaction. But we've got to remember, if we flip the reaction over, what happens to delta H? We have to flip the sign. So this will now become an exothermic reaction. So in an exothermic reaction, our reactants have greater products, that our, our reactants have greater energy than our products. So that means we draw our energy profile diagram looking like this. We have our reactants, which would be CO and H2, and our products being H2O and CH4. The delta H in this case would be the negative 206. The activation energy, I don't know from this question because they didn't tell us, but if we're asked to sketch the graph, you should label that. Okay, topic 6.1, some top tips. If you're unsure, draw an energy profile diagram, it helps a lot. And just have a quick check, how is the question being written, and know those different factors. Thanks for watching guys, don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe for more, and I'll see you.